Okay, and the weather is nice outside. I need to go out and uh, test camera lenses stuff. Always testing. One of the things people don't realize, I think most people just think I just like sit here a few times a day or whatever and make videos. I'm always answering emails, always testing something, building something, or doing something. <laughs> um, I've known that the big secrets in life is stuff that most people never go looking for because it doesn't make them money and it doesn't, you know, directly enrich their lives. And uh, I've always known the stuff that was most fascinating is the very things that other people didn't seek to know or put any energy towards and, you know, weren't really that interested. Some people, I forget who said, and I can't remember the person, said that the unexamined life is not worth living. Um, something to that effect, and I can't remember who said it offhand, but I've always been interested in fields, and I knew the one thing that scientists never understood, and they still don't, is what a field is. For Maxwellian field equations, for example, never define a field, they describe it, and descriptions are not explanations, of course, they describe it uh, over a period of time in a vector with a given result measured in joules, watts, volts, so on and so forth, but they can't actually tell you what a field is, what its essa is, what its essence is. I've always been fascinated by magnetism and uh, why it was so important. And there's no distinction or disparity between physics and metaphysics. They're both just opposite sides of the same coin. They're not two different things. They're all part of the same coinage. Is that 100% of the visible universe is due to magnetism and magnetism only. That is undeniable. One thing science did get right, it'll tell you that every atom is 99.9999999% empty space. There's just nothing there. It's like a giant balloon with a little set of marbles, tiny, tiny marbles in the center. And that, of course, too, is atomistic. Um, but the volume of an atom is mostly nothing. There's nothing there that actually involves uh, an atom. However, that is magnetodielectricity. The only thing that actually defines a uh, an atom is... Uh, that it is a dynamo, it's a magnetodielectric dynamo. The volume that makes every atom up is magnetodielectricity. It's Mother Nature's own little dynamo. And uh, there's only one fundamental particle and everything is a compound of hydrogen, so um, even things that we take as most basic, which are atoms, are themselves nothing other than multiplicative compounds of hydrogen. But getting back to magnetism, since that's what this video is about, a lot of people humorously call me Magneto, and I've, you know, if I drop dead tomorrow for whatever reason, I could at least say it'll be the first two-legged human creature on this earth to actually, accurately, and definitively define what magnetism is. And I love it when some people say, you didn't discover that, so on and so on. No. Edward Leeds Skaldin didn't. I read his little book on magnetic currents. Nikola Tesla never defined magnetism. Uh, neither did James Kirk Maxwell, Oliver Heaviside, or even Charles Proteus Steinmetz. They absolutely did not. And I've read their works many times, in fact, in most cases. So, but defining a magnet, it is qualitative in nature. It is not quantitative. What defines a magnet is not a Quantity, it is a quality. Before a magnet becomes a magnet, let's say this is one, I have some magnets in my hand right here, it is quantitatively identical, since the only thing that defines magnetism, or a magnet, is its qualitative nature of field incommensurability, such that the entire structure, whether that be sumerium cobalt, or ferrite, or neodymium iron boron, are working in unison. And then, of course, what fascinates people about a magnet is its magnetism. But the magnetism, because it is a point source object, like a laser is a point source object relative to a light bulb, and therefore very fascinating and very powerful. You know, 5 watt light bulb has never impressed anybody on this earth, unless it was the first light bulb ever. Um, never has. A 5 watt laser, however, will impress everybody on this earth that's seen what it can do and how dangerous it is. Let me repeat that again, and you should think about that if you really want to understand things. Because that is the distinction between 
um, a magnet and magnetism in general because people think, well, a magnet is magnetism. It's like, no, you don't understand. Nobody has ever been impressed by a 5-watt light bulb. I don't know if you've ever seen a 5-watt light bulb, but it's extremely unimpressive. <laughs> it's useless, in fact. But a 5-watt laser will impress everybody. So what's the distinction? It's quantitatively 5 watts of light. So what is the qualitative nature between a 5-watt light bulb and a 5-watt laser that impresses everybody? Well, it's this qualitative nature, because a laser is a point source side. People say, well, a laser is coherent light. Well, that's descriptively accurate. Accurate. By the way, most people don't realize that all lasers have columnating lenses and focusing lenses on the end of them. You know, this notion of a laser spitting out a pure little beam of lightsaber of light is, is not true, actually. But a, a laser is a point source object. Yes? And that's exactly what a magnet is. And please think about that for a second. A lot of people say, I want my children or myself to understand what a magnet is. Well, first we can define a magnet, then we can define magnetism. Well, just think about it for a second. Before something becomes what we call a magnet, and I have a magnet right here, it is 100% quantitatively identical. Atomic weight, mass, constituent components. And then when it's, it becomes a magnet, what changes? Well, nothing quantitatively changes. The qualitative nature of what defines it changes. It is now a point source object where everything is working in unison and it has FI, or what I've called field incommensurability. It is a point source object. And what fascinates anybody about a magnet is really one thing only, and that is that what it is is ab extra to what it physically is. Kind of like human being and uh, their own type of field, like, you know, like a, a hot chick, for example, a hot lady. She might be the most beautiful person on earth. You know, she doesn't say or do anything, but someone recognizes that beauty. There is effect from afar, instantaneous action at a distance. That's kind of a, <laughs> a crude representation of what a magnet does. Well, what's, that is what fascinates people about a magnet is that its, uh, that it's qualitative nature is ab extra to what it is quantitatively. In other words, the field is outside of it. And explaining what magnetism is, of course, takes another level of understanding. People always uh, email me, happened many times, confused as to why a more powerful magnet has a smaller spatial field of influence. Say this was an N45 Gauss magnet, its major uh, constituency of uh, magnetic influence, say, is about here. Yeah? You get, turn this magnet into an N55 Gauss or N58 Gauss, for example, its field of influence goes from here to here. That's because there's no such thing as magnetic attraction. Magnetism is the dielectric field. That's like saying ice is the field of water. Ice and water are not two different things. They're conjugate principles of one and the same thing. Water, right? They're not two different things. They're not at all. Human beings, however, love to conceptualize. Okay. You have to realize that. We have different words for the same thing. Ice, water, and steam. Um, I, there's probably a thousand, million different examples I can't come up, with, come up with off the top of my head, but, you know, in that same ilk. So we have to define magnetism. Magnum is, magnetism is literally the field of force. It is the toroidal force vector of force and motion. Centrifugal divergence, specifically the field of magnetism, is toroidal. Now, this is a fake apple, but it's shaped like an apple. You know, an apple is an oblate toroid. Also, too, it's kind of a, a, a circumscribed example of an egg. You could actually extrapolate this out to an egg shape. And the field around a magnet is egg-shaped, and that's the reason why North Pole and South Pole magnets have different influences. And I've made a hundred videos on this on seeds. I don't do animal experimentation, but Rawls and Davis did it on animals, worms, growing tomatoes, you could make tomatoes more acidic or less acidic depending on if you do North Pole or South Pole exposure. And the reason for that is geomagnetic precessional torque. It creates a phase disparity. And the phase disparity exists at a, ra a rarefaction of 1 at the North Pole and a compression of phi, 1.618 at the South Pole. And that's the reason. And water is a polar molecule. That's a fact also. Um, 
Also, too, if one were, as I do, egotistically I say, uh, to understand magnetism completely, then explaining countless millions of phenomena that we witness in the universe are extremely easy. Understanding what a black hole is, and I've made many videos about black holes, okay? Explaining what a black hole is is very simple. Explaining why there is magnetic polar shift on the Earth, X number, I think it's what the average is like 30,000 years. Sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. Explaining pole shifts is extremely easy. I could explain to a child, and he, there's not a single here person on this earth, other than myself, and I state that uh, emphatically, has ever told anybody or has any idea why the earth shifts its poles. I could explain to a child right now why an earth shifts its poles. I don't have my gyroscope in front of me, it's right over there. And, but I'm sure you've seen this. If you spin up a gyroscope, a good one anyway, with low friction bearings, it will start to do this number, it'll start to process, yeah? And it'll process some more, and it'll flip. And then it'll keep spinning really good, and it'll start to process some more. And if you've got a really good gyroscope with low friction bearings, it'll process more, and it'll flip again. It's the exact same reason. It is torque. It is field tension build up from geomagnetic precession. This geomagnetic precession actually has a frequency, too, and the frequency varies. The average is like 42 megahertz. It's also called the Lamore frequency. So anyway, explaining countless, countless cosmic phenomena from macro to micro, talking about cosmology, we're obviously talking about the macro. And the universe is simple if you understand magnetism. Since magnetism defines everything in the visible universe, then I came up to the conclusion, conclusion decades ago that, well, you know, since that's the case, then understanding magnetism is kind of fundamental or the key to understanding the universe. And that, my girlfriend, is undeniable. Anyway, getting back to the conjugate geometry. The conjugate geometry of the universe is the torus and the hyperboloid. They are the negative image of one another. A torus is a donut shape, a hyperboloid is an hourglass shape. The negative image of an hourglass is a torus. The negative image of a torus is an hourglass. They are respectively the geometry of force and motion, inertia and acceleration. Literally, the yin and the yang of the entire universe, both seen and unseen. Yes, charge and discharge, force and motion, inertia and acceleration, capacitance, resistance, permeability, permittivity, explains everything in the universe. Absolutely everything. Literally everything. Space is the after effect of a divergent centrifugal magnetic field. Since everything that has volume in the universe, yes, is due to... Ma this is an air blower, by the way. I know what it looks like. It's an air blower. Since everything in the universe has volume due to magnetism only, what do you think the after effect of increasing centrifugal force divergence is? Well, it's the creation of space. Space is exactly like the shadow. Space is the negative image of true infinity. I repeat that again. Space is the after effect of a divergent magnetic field and the negative image of infinity. People say space is infinite. It's like, no, space is the after effect, the, uh, the lesser image, the copy, the counterfeit of true infinity, which is pure potential. What's the op of, uh, opposite of pure potential? Pure impotency, pure, uh, um, um, pure discharge, pure... Uh, I don't want to use the word entropy, but the opposite of pure potential, the opposite of energy, the opposite of fullness, the opposite, because space, just like a shadow, is not a thing. Space has no properties, as Nikola Tesla, quote-unquote, said. Space has no properties, therefore it cannot act on anything. This is why he rejected the relativity. It's why he rejected Albert Einstein and the cult of relativity and of the atomists. If you understand what magnetism is, you also understand what space is. Because magnetism is literally the creation of space. Why is this? Explaining this is, even though it's extremely simple to comprehend with wisdom, explaining it is incredibly hard. Is that if you take the principle, and what the dielectric is, is pure principle, which is the ether under stress or strain. Ether under stress or strain, excuse me. The loss of that energy or potential manifests a three-dimensional S-curve. The three-dimensional S-curve in pure extrapolation is the toroidal geometry of force and motion, i.e. magnetism. Why is magnetism at all? Is there a reason 
No, because there is no first cause or original sin, i.e. prima causa, in monistic monism, nor to in logic and wisdom and understanding of the nature of the universe, there is no f original sin or first cause, extrinsic attribute of the absolute. That's the reason why the secret of the universe, which was my discovery, found in Plato's Republic 509D to 511, is tattooed right here on the inside of my right wrist. It's 1 over phi to the power of negative 3, or 1 over 0 0.23606, which is, like I said, phi to the power of negative 3. And that is, of course, phi cubed. 1 over phi to the power of negative 3 equals phi cubed. This is, by the way, is the ancient Pythagorean, and who knows before them, the Pythagorean trinity. The extrinsic attribute of the absolute loss of that energy or inertia manifest expanding and contracting toroidal loops that follow a three-dimensional S-curve, which, of course, extrapolates the exterior and interior geometry of the torus. Once again, though, the negative image of the torus is the hyperboloid, i.e. the geometry of inertia and acceleration, the geometry of the dielectric. Yes? The geometry of the dielectric. Space is the after-effect of the divergent centrifugal force and motion field, i.e. magnetism, of the loss of that energy or inertia. Space is impotency of potential, impotency of charge, of actuality. It is the mirror image and therefore counterfeit and impotency of absolute infinity, meaning subspace, zero space, ether. You could talk about... Uh, um, there's a thousand names that it's called. We could call it heaven. We could call it uh, 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 liberation matrix. We could call it all, all sorts of stuff. The matrix, of course, well, I don't get into matrix analogies. Then it really confuses the hell out of everybody. I'm not getting into those stupid movie analogies anyway. But Literally, the universe is as simple as that. People say, isn't it just dielectricity and magnetism? What about electricity and gravity? Well, gravity doesn't exist. The phenomena of gravity certainly does exist. Nobody denies this is going on, but that's nothing other than electrostatic torsion. Same thing when you stick your hands in a box full of uh, styrofoam pellets and you get a package opened up, they stick to your hand. That's just electrostatic torsion, mutual mass acceleration. There's no such thing. People say, well, what, when you show somebody this, what's going on here? It's like, well, that's magnetic attraction. No, there's no such thing as magnetic attraction because magnetism is literally, by definition, the opposite of attraction, i.e. increasing inertia and acceleration. Magnetism is literally the force vector of centrifugal divergence. So that is not magnetic attraction. Magnetic attraction is a misnomer. So well, if two magnets are accelerating towards one another, that's got to be magnetism. No, 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 no. There's a superficial understanding in your mind and we've all been brainwashed this with this nonsense. I was, and so were you, but I was smarter than my teachers by far, and I knew that they were wrong, so that's not possible. Magnetism cannot be at one and the same time. You know, the field uh, geometry of force and centrifugal divergence and also be the geometry of increasing inertia and acceleration. It's not possible. It cannot be that. But that's like saying um, ice is also water. We know ice is ice. Is that water? That's ice. But we also, too, fundamentally know that ice is water, right? So we can say in a roundabout fashion, however not accurately, that magnetism is also dielectricity. So when we say magnetic attraction, we're kind of, on a subliminal level, accurate, but there's no such thing as magnetic attraction because that misdefines what magnetism is by its actual definition, which is centrifugal force in motion. Um, but people believe that. That's just point source mutual mass acceleration. So-called gravity is nothing other than non-point source or incoherent mutual mass acceleration. It's still electrostatic acceleration. It's the voidance of space. Space is the byproduct of a divergent magnetic field. The erasure of space is the erasure of magnetism to entropy or increasing inertia and acceleration towards the plane of inertia or counter space or subspace or zero point. I don't care what name you call it. Mother Nature doesn't care at all. But magnetic attraction does not exist at all. Electricity is just a hybrid of dielectricity and magnetism. Phi times psi equals Q and Planck of electrification. So electricity is a hybrid. Gravity does not exist. The phenomena we call gravity is just electrostatic acceleration. The exact same thing we call gravity is the exact same thing dumb human beings call magnetic attraction. Let me repeat that again. The same thing human beings call gravity is 100% the exact same thing dumb human beings call magnetic attraction. Yes? No distinction between a light bulb and a laser. They're both light, right? Well, those are two different things. A laser is dangerous and it's powerful. It's like, yeah, but it's still light. 
The difference is, is that light bulb, 5 watt light bulb, which is useless and nobody's impressed by, and a 5 watt laser, which everybody's impressed by, are only defined in distinction between one another by one being point source and the other one being non-point source. We could say incoherent if you like, but either way. If you understand these fundamental principles as the foundation of the universe, you will understand more than you'll ever realize. Everything will become abundantly clear. Do you know why? Because it's like having a key inside your head. It's like having a Rosetta Stone, a primer. Do you know what a primer is? A primer is like a key code. You know, like in a map, they'd have a legend down on the bottom. You know, you look at a map, I don't know what this stuff means. Well, with a legend down here, it tells you what this stuff means. You have to have the legend or the primer. Yes, with the primer of understanding fundamental field mechanics of the cosmic universe, from macro to micro, from one end of the universe to the other, you understand more than you thought you'd understand. Because once you understand the foundation of everything, then you kind of understand everything. You don't have to know all the specifics. You just need to know the foundation. When you know the foundation, you know the rest of it. You don't have to know the rest of it intimately or specifically, but you will understand the rest of it. Think about that. This is an important video, even if it's boring and I'm sitting here next to the digital fireplace. It's important. Now, one thing I can be proud of in this life, you know, no wife, no kids, wife is dead, is that, you know, I'm the first human critter. And you can't refute me. Well, so-and-so understood it first. Like, no, they didn't. There's nobody to find magnetism. I'm the first person on Earth to do it. I'm at least proud of the fact that I uncovered one of the great mysteries of the universe and the first human being to have done so. No, you weren't. Prove me wrong. Because you can't. Because I was. All the people that you think discovered it first, they never wrote about it. I've been through Tesla, Faraday, and Steinmetz's and Heaviside's work way more than you have. I've read all of it. If you think you have, then you haven't read it, because they never mentioned any of these things that I talked about. They would mention little pieces here and there, little tiny bits, but they never painted the picture. No, they never did. Anyway, I hope you liked this video. I hope you learned something from it. If you did, I'm a poor schmuck, and any donation is always kindly welcome in the description below. Or you could tell me to jump off a cliff. Whatever makes you happy. Thanks so much for watching. Lux Everetus. Goodbye.